Welcome to procurements under FEMA awards during periods of emergency or exigency. Uh, go ahead, Dan. You're good to go, Barry. Okay. All right, my name is Barry McMeekin. I will be moderating this session for GFOA. Uh, I am going to introduce Eve Helms from FEMA in a minute. Um, but prior to that, I wanted to briefly go through a couple of slides. Um, as you can see on the right hand side, you should have access to not only this presentation, but also um, some documentation that was provided by FEMA that goes along with this presentation. Um, so, just briefly, um, can you go to the next slide, Eve? You got control, Barry. Uh, okay. Um, so, if you look at the, the fiscal first aid site that we're talking about, these steps were created in 2008 in response to the Great Recession. Um, we are refreshing this resource based on a number of different things uh, to meet the current crisis. And one of those things is um, working with FEMA to uh, go over FEMA reimbursement and how it's helping local governments to bridge the financial gap by reimbursing qualified expenditures, which is what this uh, presentation is going to touch on. So uh, I will introduce Eve to you and she will take over from there. Um, Eve Helms is a program specialist with the Procurement Disaster Assistance Team of FEMA, where her main function is to support FEMA's various program areas with procurement under grant subject matter expertise, whether that comes in the form of a training, contract, document reviews, or more. Um, she began with FEMA as a local hire and individual assistance, where she worked in information management. She then became a reservist in the public assistance cadre. It was here she had her introduction to procurement under grants working closely with PDAT and disaster leadership to manage contract reviews and process implementation in the field. Eve, welcome aboard. All right, thank you, Barry. Uh, I do just wanna say, oh, okay, I'm now the presenter, all right. So let me go ahead to the beginning. Uh, thank you, Barry, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Procurement Under Grants presentation. This session is designed to introduce you all to procurement and the federal procurement regulations applicable to PA recipients and subrecipients. As Barry said, this presentation will be geared towards sole sourcing in emergency and exigent circumstances. Uh, I know this is an online presentation format, but if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat box throughout the presentation. I believe Barry will be managing that for me. Um, and I will also take questions at the end of this presentation. So if you don't feel like asking in the middle of the whole shebang, please don't worry. I will be available after as well to clarify any concepts. So today, you all are going to gain a general knowledge of the federal procurement rules. You know, we're, I'm not here to make you guys an expert. You're not going to get up tomorrow and give this presentation. Um, but we really do want to introduce some of these high-risk areas, areas you all need to look out for, especially as you are sole sourcing in emergency and exigent circumstances. So we will go over you know, what emergency or exigent circumstances are, some of the additional requirements that come along with this method of procurement. Uh, and then we'll also briefly cover how you all can use your pre-existing contracts in order to respond to COVID-19 or any emergency uh, or exigent situation in the future. And so we also want to introduce you to some of the many tools and resources available to you. Uh, as Barry mentioned, there are three documents available for download on the right-hand side. I can't see that um, in presenter mode, but I'm going to trust that it is there. Uh, if you would like any more information on procurement under grants, on the procurement disaster assistance team, um, feel free to go to the PDAT website. That link will pop up later in the presentation. 
Uh, or you can just Google FEMA PETA, and there will be a whole slew of resources available, including a video, well, in the next week, uh, a video of this presentation that you could view at your own leisure. And so the rules we're going to be going over today um, are found at 2 CFR, and CFR stands for Code of Federal Regulations. Sections 200.317 through 200.326. And you can see those all listed in the middle there. I'm not going to go through every single one right now. Um, honestly, not going to go through every single one today since this is such a specialized training. Uh, but I do want you all to start thinking about why these rules ex exist. You know, they're not here to throw a wrench in the works, they're not here to make your recovery efforts more difficult. Um, these rules really are in place for two reasons. One, to ensure reasonable costs. The federal government wants to make sure that all applicants are getting the lowest, most effective cost option at all times, and they want to ensure that these applicants are responsible stewards of the taxpayer dollar. So, you know, just as the federal government has to be responsible um, with our money, you guys have to be responsible with those funds as well. Uh, we also want to make sure that these funds are being used in compliance with some of these various other public policy goals, these other policy initiatives. So uh, we have our socioeconomic contractor requirements at uh, 200.321, and we want to encourage these disadvantaged businesses to participate um, in the solicitation and the award of the contracts. You know, given that opportunity, we want to make sure that these uh, funds are being used in compliance with some of the various EPA guidelines, you know, recovered materials, the Clean Water Act, things like that. And so the first question, question any entity needs to ask themselves is what entity am I? And the answer to that is going to dictate all of the procurement actions after. And so if you're a state entity, you are any state of the United States, the District of Columbia, where I currently am, any of the U.S. territories, so we're talking Puerto Rico, Guam, Virgin Islands, the American Samoa, uh, the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, uh, any state agency, or any instrumentality of a state. And if you are a state entity, there are only three rules you need to follow. The first rule is found at 2 CFR section 200.317, and that rule says that state entities must follow their own procurement policies and procedures. So whatever is outlined in their own procurement policies is exactly what they are going to do when they are requesting federal reimbursement. Nothing changes. Additionally, if the work being performed requires the use of materials, they need to make sure that they are complying with the recovered materials provision at 200.322. This is an EPA guideline, an EPA requirement, so if you have any questions on recovered materials and the applicability to your work, make sure you're going to epa.gov and you're following, that, following up there, or you can reach out to your EPA re representative. Uh, lastly, all contracts must contain all of the required contract provisions at 200, 2 CFR 200.326. And so that is it for state entities. They need to follow their own procurement policies and procedures, uh, comply with the use of recovered materials, and include all of the required contract provisions in all of their contracts. And so if you are a non-state entity, it's a little bit different. And so a non-state entity is going to be local governments, tribal governments, institutions of higher education, hospitals, houses of worship, or one of the various other eligible private nonprofit organizations. And so if you're a non-state entity, you need to follow your own procurement policies and procedures in addition to applicable state or tribal law, and you also need to make sure that all of your procurements comply with the federal procurement regulations at 2 CFR sections 
200.318 through 200.326. And you can see all of those listed on the right side there. This is obviously triple what state entities have to do, but hopefully we can um, make this process a little less confusing. And so I do want to say that as a non-state entity, you have three levels of rules and regulations that you need to be aware of and you need to make sure that you are complying with. And so in instances where there is a conflict, uh, non-state entities must comply with the most restrictive rule or regulation. So I want to repeat that because this is the most important thing that I can say that is applicable to non-state entities. You need to be aware of your own policies and procedures, applicable state or tribal law, and the federal procurement rules. And between all three levels of these rules or regulations, you need to comply with the most restrictive rule or regu regulation. And so we will do a quick survey question. Uh, hopefully you were paying attention. What rules are applicable to non-state entities? Uh, answer A, 2 CFR section 200.317. B, 2 CFR section 200.322. C, 2 CFR section 200.326 or D, 2 CFR sections 200.318 through 200.326. So you can go ahead and answer the poll question there. All right, I will continue. I'm not sure if people answered. Barry, uh, hopefully you are tracking the response. Yeah, you're okay to go with you. All right, great. All right, and so now we're going to touch on this idea of full and open competition, creating a fair playing field. And so full and open competition is a key principle and, you know, honestly, the backbone to many of the federal procurement rules. And what it essentially means is that all qualified and responsible sources have the ability to compete for a contract without restrictions. So, you know, think of it like this, it's the beginning of a new track season. That track coach is going to hold tryouts. He's going to make sure that every single student in the school has the ability to try out for the team. He's going to post flyers in the hallways. He's going to make an announcement on the loudspeaker. Uh, he's going to jump in there for the daily morning brief. He's going to make sure he's done everything in his power to let the students know it's time to try out for the team. And that's exactly what we mean when we say full and open competition. It is the applicant giving these eligible contractors the ability to try out for the team. And so by doing this, by casting the net broadly, the applicant is ensuring that they're going to get the lowest, most effective cost option from the most uh, qualified contractor, and they're ensuring that they're preventing some of these other non-competitive pricing practices, such as favoritism, fraud, waste, abuse, collusion, things like that. And so now we will touch briefly on the five methods of procurement available to the applicant. These are listed at 2 CFR section 200.320. Um, we will only touch briefly on the four initial methods of procurement because this slide presentation is geared towards sole sourcing in emergency or exigent circumstances. And so if you would like any more information on the other methods of procurement available to you, you can go to the PDAT website. Once again, just Google FEMA PDAT, P-D-A-T, and you can go to our field manual and take a look at the information that we have provided there. Uh, it's a super, super helpful resource. And so micro-purchase procedures can be used when acquiring goods or services totaling no more than $10,000. And if you are using micro-purchase procedures, all you have to do is uh, document that the cost is fair and reasonable. So let us know, you know, what market research you did, um, 
any sort of historical purchases of the exact or comparable goods uh, to let us know that your price points are reasonable. You know, any documentation you can provide um, letting us know that it's, it's, the prices are fair. Um, and then also you need to make sure that you only award your contracts to responsible contractors. So you also need to demonstrate that you have come to the de determination uh, that this vendor is a responsible contractor. Applicants can then use small purchase procedures when acquiring goods or services totaling no more than the simplified acquisition threshold of $250,000. And if an applicant is using this method of procurement, they need to acquire no less than three price or rate quotations from qualified and responsible quant contractors. And so the applicant will need to provide documentation of these quotes, you know, upload it to their grants portal profile, uh, let us know that they once again determined that the contractor is responsible, um, and then they should be good to go. And then for any purchases above the simplified acquisition threshold, the applicant will need to conduct a competitive method of procurement, either sealed bidding or competitive proposals. And if an applicant is conducting one of these more complex methods of procurement, they need to make sure that they're receiving independent estimates before receiving bids or proposals. And so an independent estimate is essentially the applicant's way of doing market research, right? So before sending their solicitation out to bid, you know, publishing their solicitation, they're going to call up a couple contractors, uh, provide them with a the scope of work and say, hey, you know, how much should this generally cost? Um, and so they'll get a, a, you know, two or three price quotation so that they know once they start receiving their bids or proposals what a reasonable cost is. You know, it's just get, giving themselves that benchmark for reasonable cost. Additionally, for procurements over $250,000, applicants must conduct a price or cost analysis. And I'll dive into that a little bit more in a few slides. I think it's in about three or four slides, so I'm not going to go into intense detail now. And so the focus of our presentation today is going to be sole sourcing, a non-competitive method of procurement in emergency or exigent circumstances. There are four circumstances when an applicant can sole source or conduct a non-competitive method of procurement. If you would like to learn about the other three, once again, go to the FEMA PDAT website and you can take a look at our uh, uh, field manual for any information on, you know, single source, inadequate competition, or awarding agency approval. But today we are only focusing on emergency and exigent circumstances. And so sole sourcing in emergency or exigent circumstances occurs, uh, you know, when there is some sort of situation that demands immediate aid or action. And people use these terms interchangeably, but they really do mean very different things. And so an emergency circumstance is when there is a need to alleviate a threat to life, public health or safety, or improved property. And so an example of an emergency circumstance, this would be a disaster example, uh, of an emergency, emergency circumstance would be if say, you know, um, there's a storm and it causes a downed power line. And this power line is hanging near an apartment building, it's over a sidewalk, it's live, it could set the building on fire, it could uh, hit someone underneath it. That power line is clearly a threat to life, public health or safety, or improved property. And so what an applicant can do is just call someone up, any random contractor, and say, hey, uh, you know, you gotta, you gotta get out here and you gotta get rid of this uh, power line. We, we got to get this down. It's going to set the building on fire. It could hurt someone. Uh, you know, how much is this going to cost? You're going to make sure that those costs are reasonable and that this is a responsible contractor. So make sure you're checking SAM.gov and you're doing a quick little market research. Um, and then they will come out there. And Eve, I have one them. question from the audience on that if you have a minute. Um, what if they are not listed in SAM.gov? Are they determined not responsible at that point? 
Nope. And so that happens, and we will touch on that later on in the presentation. Okay. Um, so just that specific situation. An exigent circumstance is when there's a need to avoid, prevent, or alleviate serious harm or injury, financial or otherwise. So this is another uh, disaster example. But, you know, every year in Augusta, Georgia, they have this thing called the Masters Golf Tournament. And I honestly had no idea what that was until I joined the PDAT team. I am not a fan of golf. I know nothing of golf. If you ever asked me to golf with you, you would regret it very quickly after. Um, but one year, you know, there was a storm and it caused massive amounts of debris in the roads. And all of this debris was uh, you know, preventing people from getting to the tournament. But this tournament is the bread and butter for Augusta, Georgia. It's actually factored into their yearly financial budget. And so if people weren't able to get to the tournament, if they weren't able to host this tournament, they would have taken a severe economic hit. And so what they did is, you know, they called up some contractors in the area. They said, hey, you got to come out here right now, get this debris out of the roadways, so that people can get to the tournament. They then justified their exigent circumstance to FEMA, and, you know, let us know the financial repercussions if they weren't able to host the tournament, and FEMA agreed that, yes, this is an exigent circumstance. And so those are examples of how these two uh, differ. But if you are sole sourcing in an emergency or exigent circumstance, non-state entities must justify with documentation. And so one of the documents provided to you all today is sole sourcing and emergency or exigent circumstances fact sheet. It is a super, super helpful fact sheet. It's the public assistance fact sheet. And it goes through the differences between emergency or exigent circumstances, and it also provides a template for how you all should be drafting your justifications. When I was in the field, this is the number one document I passed out to applicants. It is extremely helpful if you are conducting a non-competitive procurement due to E&E &E circumstances. So if this is something you, know, you think you're gonna be utilizing in response to COVID-19, uh, make sure you're using the fact sheet provided. Also, for these emergency contracts, you need to make sure that you are only using them during the actual period of exigent or emergency circumstances. And so you all, as applicants, get to define your own time period, your own emergency period, your own exigent period. Uh, that's on you. You have to define it and include it in your justification uh, documentation. And then you need to make sure that you are only using those contracts during that period. After that period is over, you need to make sure that you're transitioning to a contract procured through a competitive method of procurement. Okay. Eve, I have a couple questions if you have a second. Uh, yeah. First one is where do they find the template you just talked about? So it's on the fact sheet provided in the document that you uploaded to the training. Uh, but they could also find it on the public assistance website or even our PDAT website. All they would have to do is Google FEMA PA fact sheets, and it would be the first link uh, in the Google search, and they would scroll down and find the fact sheet there. Uh, and can you please repeat the level that the three quotes are required at? Is it at uh, 250000 Yes, but remember, if you are a non-state entity, you must comply with the most restrictive rule or regulation. And so the federal simplified acquisition threshold is $250,000. I have yet to see an entity have a threshold that high. And so they need to be aware of their own simplified acquisition threshold and comply with whichever one is most restrictive. Most of them, you know, are around fifty or $60,000. So this is one where you need to know your own rules and regulations in addition to the federal requirements. And then I had one on procurement limits. Are the procurement limits per procurement, or are they a cumulative total for the fiscal year? 
Um, I'm not sure what you mean by procurement limits. So do you mean, so when we talk about rules applicable. I think you mean the thresholds. So yeah, it's per procurement. So whatever the contract cost is, that the you have to go by that cost for the to find out the applicable rules. And okay. so if you have a contract and you're going to issue purchase orders off of it, you're yeah, pur issue purchase orders off of it throughout the year and it will be, you know, the first purchase order for $10,000, the second purchase order for $100,000, the third for like 60 or 70, you're over the simplified acquisition threshold. And so you would need to have conducted a competitive method of procurement for that contract. Okay. Then I had one other question. I'm not sure because I didn't um, actually go into documentation we posted thus far, but um, there was a question on can a copy of the fact sheet um, be posted to that website? I'm not sure if that was part of the packet you sent me. Yes, it was. Okay. All right. Should be up there then. All right. Thanks. Okay. And so we have another question now. It's going to be what is an emergency circumstance? A is going to be need to alleviate a threat to life, public health or safety, or improved property. B, need to avoid, prevent, or alleviate serious harm or injury, financial or otherwise. So go ahead and answer the poll on the right-hand side. And Barry, let me know when it's good to move forward. Okay. One sec. Mm And I think you can go ahead and move on. Okay, great. All right, and so now we're going to talk about sole sourcing uh, directly related to COVID-19. And so on, oh, this slide isn't set up correctly. I think something must have happened when you were doing the updates, but that's okay because I have it memorized. So on January 27th, 2020, Health and Human Services declared a public health emergency. Uh, on March 13th, the President of the United States made a national emergency declaration, and that um, Decla declaration prompted FEMA to issue a memo on March 17th stating that COVID-19 qualifies as an emergency or exigent circumstance, and that means non-state entities may sole source under that exception. And so I want to say this even more, you know, I want to make it as simple as possible for you all to understand. FEMA has acknowledged and agreed that COVID-19 is an emergency circumstance. So you all can conduct non-competitive procurements to get your goods or services or whatever you need in response. You do not have to go through an entire competitive procurement. You don't have to put together a solicitation. You don't have to send it out to bid. You don't have to conduct a bid opening. You can conduct a non-competitive procurement to respond to or recover from COVID-19. And this is for non-state entities only. State entities still have to follow their own procurement rules and procedures. And so this exception is only applicable to contracts entered into or used on or after January 27th, 2020, which is the date Health and Human Services declared a public health emergency. Now I do want to say that the applicant is able to define their own emergency period. So even if in pub, uh, Health and Human, Human Services hasn't done this yet, um, but even if your emergency period extends beyond the Health and Human Services public health declaration, that's fine. 
you still need to justify it in your documentation, but you do not all of a sudden have to conduct competitive procurement because Health and Human Services has declared that the emergency is over. You all get to define your own emergency period. And so if you are sole sourcing uh, under e and &E circumstances as a response to COVID-19, there are a few things you need to keep in mind. One, only use during the period of actual public health or emergency, but remember, I just said that you all define your own emergency period. So if it extends beyond uh, the public health emergency, just make sure you're appropriately documenting that. Uh, make sure you're also including a justification. So just because FEMA has said, yes, this is an emergency circumstance, that doesn't mean that you don't have to comply with the additional requirements. You still need to provide that justification and let FEMA know what your specific emergency circumstance is. Uh, you also need to conduct a cost or price analysis, and we will discuss that in, I believe, two slides, so I won't go into it now. And for any construction or facility improvement contracts, so think, you know, if you're building a temporary medical site, temporary, uh, or, or, you know, making some updates or doing some construction to turn an existing building into a temporary medical site, you all need to make sure you're complying with the bonding requirements at 200.325. Also, you got to make sure that all of your contracts include the required contract provisions. Now, remember, the required provisions differs based on contract amount, uh, project type, work type. So not all provisions are applicable at all times. You should be using the contract provisions template which is available on our PDAT website. Barry has also included it in the documents available to you all today. Um, so it's the contract provisions template. Make sure you are using this template to help you determine when and if contract provisions are applicable. Um, also, if you're entering into a time and materials contract, you gotta make sure you're following all of the limitations. Uh, listed in 200.318 subsection J, you got to make sure that you are not entering it into any cost plus percentage of cost contracts. They are absolutely prohibited. FEMA will not reimburse the cost plus percentage of cost contracts. Applicants need to make sure that they are only awarding to responsible contractors, uh, and that is that SAM.gov search, so I will be getting to that answer soon enough. Um, and then also make sure you're following all of the general documentation, oversight, and conflict of interest requirements. So these are all of the requirements that are in place even when you are conducting a non-competitive method of procurement. All right, and so as I said, a cost of price analysis is required for all procurements over the simplified acquisition threshold of $250,000. And the goal is to help you and us determine if the price is fair and reasonable. And so this is a requirement even in emergency or exigent circumstances. And so a price analysis is the simpler version uh, of this. And so, you know, say I am gonna redo my kitchen. And so I call up a contractor and I say, hey, I want to get my, uh, I want new flooring, I want new countertops, uh, I want a new stove, I'd like you to paint, uh, and maybe a new sink as well. How much is all of that going to cost? And he's going to come back to me and say, mm, it's going to be around $36,000. And in that price he just gave me, that includes the labor, materials, profit, you know, any other miscellaneous costs, he's just giving it to me as the whole price. And so a price analysis is uh, comparing whole prices. A cost analysis is a little bit different. Different. So instead of telling me, you know, oh, that whole thing's going to cost $36,000, I'm going to say, okay, but what is that $36,000 made up of? And he's going to say, okay, well, the 
floors is going to be $4,000. The new sink will be $3,000. The new countertop is going to be another $7,000. And he goes through the list. He gives me an itemized list of what goes into that total price. And so he's laying it out by the separate cost element. And so a cost analysis is comparing the separate cost element between all of your bids or proposals. And so something that you all need to keep in mind is that profit needs to be negotiated as a separate element for your sole source contract. So if you conducted a non-competitive method of procurement, whether it's uh, a non-competitive method of procurement, um, we need to know how much profit the contractor is going to make off of that contract, okay? Because it's non-competitive, right? So they have the ability to jack up prices, increase their profits, which means that it could lead to unreasonable costs. So you need to clearly outline profit for all sole source contracts. Also, profit must be a separate cost element if you're conducting a cost analysis. So just like you're going to see the cost of the floors, the cost of the uh, countertops, the cost of the labor, the cost of the materials, profit is going to be a cost element as well. We want to see that clearly outlined. And so now we're going to touch on bonding requirements. And as I said, bonding requirements are only applicable to construction or facility contracts over the simplified acquisition threshold of $250,000. And applicants need to make sure that their bonding requirements aren't restricting competition. And so the federal rules references three types of bonding. We have a bid guarantee, and that it needs to be included with the contractor's bid or proposal. And it needs to be uh, checked for 5% of the total bid price. And then there is a performance bond and a payment bond to be submitted at the time of award of the contract for 100% of the contract price. So if you have any projects in mind, any projects you're going to be completing that includes construction or facility improvement, uh, make sure you have these bonding requirements, you keep these bonding requirements in mind. And so now we're going to touch on the required and recommended contract provisions. And so a lot of applicants make this mistake. A lot of applicants leave these required provisions out. Um, in my mind, this is the easiest regulation to comply with, and that is because FEMA, well, we have PDAT. FEMA PDAT has created a contract provisions template that lets you know when each clause is applicable and provides draft language for you to include in your contracts. You will need to modify this language, um, you know, to suit your entity type, your entity name, the contractor name, work type, what have you. So you do need to do a few modifications. Don't just copy and paste and think you're safe. Uh, but the language is there. You do your few modifications and you're automatically compliant. So make sure you are using the contract provisions template available. It is included in the documents provided to you. Uh, you can also find it on the PDAT website. You can, the link is available on the slide there, fema.gov slash procurement dash disaster dash assistance dash team or Google FEMA PDAT. Uh, I will say that these clauses are in place to protect you and the federal government. Um, we get a lot of questions on, um, you know, what do we do if we can't get the required contract provisions in the contract, uh, especially in emergency and exigent circumstances, you really don't have the time to negotiate with the contractor for weeks. Um, over a contract provision. And I will say, you know, they're required at all times, regardless of circumstances. But if you are unable to get a required contract provision in the contract, make sure you are including that in your E&E &E justification uh, and your documentation to FEMA. So it's something that you actively worked towards but were unable to do. And that is only for E&E &E circumstances. But still, it's a requirement at all times. And then you all need to keep in mind um, that you cannot limit FEMA access to records. Uh, if you do have a clause in your contract that is, you know, prohibiting FEMA access to records or the U.S. Comptroller General, we cannot reimburse those contracts. 
it, you know, there's nothing that you can do to bring it into compliance. If there is a clause restricting us to records, we cannot reimburse that contract. And I know you're thinking, why would I draft that? That is, obviously, I'm not going to put that in my contract if, if FEMA is going to be reimbursing this work. But, you know, with these contracts, uh, with vendors, you might be using their contract templates, their draft contracts, um, their purchase order format. And so uh, they might have one of these clauses. And so don't just jump into a contract willy-nilly, you know, it's in a rush, it's an emergency, but make sure you're double checking, triple checking that this clause is not included in the contract because you will be risking your FEMA reimbursement. And we've seen it. I, uh, you know, I, I think it's a very odd provision to include. I personally would not include it in my contract, um, but make sure, you know, you're, you're doing your due diligence, you're checking it's there. And so now we will touch on time and materials contracts. I'm going through a lot of material, so remember I'm here for questions. You can slow me down if I'm going too fast. Um, but a time and material contract is a contract whose costs uh, are made up of direct labor hours charged at fixed hourly rates, uh, plus the actual cost of materials. And so an applicant should only be using a time and materials contract after determining that no other contract type is suitable. And this is something that needs to be documented. And so time and material contracts are generally only used when there's some element of the scope of work that's unclear. And so for a lot of the COVID-19 response activities, I think right now it's initially hard to uh, uh, develop a clear scope of work. Um, you know, you don't know how widespread uh, uh, the pandemic will be in your community. You don't know how many ventilators you're going to need. You don't know how many, you know, PPE you'll need, um, how many test kits. You just don't know. And so in these instances, when you're unable to define a scope of work, a time and materials contract may make sense. And if you are using a time and materials contract, you need to be sure that that contract includes a ceiling price, that the contractor exceeds at its own risk. And that is because, you know, a time and materials contract doesn't have any sort of internal inherent cost controls. And so that ceiling price acts as a cost control. It's the applicant's way of saying, hey, I don't know how much this is going to be, you know, in total but I know it's not going to be any more than $3 million, right? So they're just putting that cost control in place. Additionally, the applicant is going to act as a cost control themselves, you know. Uh, everyone needs to maintain a high degree of oversight in order to avoid unneeded cost overruns. So once again, uh, that ceiling price is a cost control, and then you yourself need to be a cost control. And then the applicant needs to be sure that they are only using this contract until the scope of work becomes clear. Once that scope of work becomes clear, you should be transitioning to a more uh, acceptable contract type, you know, uh, fixed price, the unit price, uh, something along those lines. So the big takeaway is you do need to justify and document use of time and materials contracts. Have a ceiling price, maintain oversight. Now, cost plus percentage of cost contracts. Right off the bat, these are 100% prohibited. Do not enter into a cost plus percentage of cost contract. And so there are a few criteria that you can use to help you determine if you're, you know, working with a CPPC contract or not. Uh, the first thing you need to review, uh, it, you know, is payment at a predetermined rate. Is that rate then applied to the actual performance cost? This is a big one. This is a huge indicator. Contractor's entitlement is uncertain at the time of contracting. And so if you can't use all of the numbers provided, all of the information provided, do the math and come up with how much that contractor will be making off of the project, then you might be dealing with a cost plus percentage cost contract. Uh, and then the last one, uh, that contractor's entitlement increases with increased performance costs. 
And so this contract type is prohibited because there's no incentive to control costs and there's actually a financial interest in increasing the cost of performance. So because their profit is tied to the project cost, they're gonna wanna increase that project cost because that means more money in their own pocket. And so this is prohibited because it largely leads to unreasonable costs, uh, you know, gargantuan costs. And so if you have any questions on what kind of contract type you're dealing with, make sure you are sending it over to FEMA, shooting it over to FEMA. Uh, if your uh, field representative can't make a determination, they will shoot it up to us and PDAT will do a review and we can let you know. Okay, and so now we're gonna to touch on responsible contractors. So for the participant who asked about SAM.gov and what to do if they are in a system, I will be answering your question on this slide. And so every single applicant has the responsibility, responsibility to only award contracts to responsible contractors. And so there are a few questions an applicant can ask themselves. Um, in making the responsibility determination. You know, is this contractor able to perform successfully under the procurement's terms and conditions? Do they have evidence of integrity? Have they been compliant with public policy? Do they have a good record of past performance? Uh, you know, have they demonstrated that they have adequate financial and technical resources to get the job done? And if the applicant can answer yes to all of these questions, they then need to check that the contractor is not suspended or debarred. And so every single applicant needs to go to sam.gov, type in the contractor name, uh, you know, hit enter and uh, uh, see if that contractor has been suspended or debarred. And so two things are gonna show up, either yes, this contractor is suspended or debarred and you are obviously not going to afford your contract to that person, um, or it's gonna say, you know, no results found or this contractor is not on the suspended, suspension or debarment list. Uh, and that's good too, because that means either one, they, aren't suspended or debarred, or two, they haven't registered for SAM.gov. Regardless, make sure you're taking a screenshot uh, with your snipping tool of your search results and include that in your procurement profile. You do need to document that you took this step. Uh, and if your contractor has not registered to SAM.gov, include that snapshot, but also make sure you're able to answer the questions on the right-hand side. You know, have they demonstrated that they're able to get the job done? Do they have evidence of integrity or are they in the middle of um, arbitration for getting up in the middle of a project and walking away? Have they been compliant with public policy or have they been caught dumping waste in the nearest river? Um, you know, look into their record of past performance and uh, financial and technical resources. So regardless of whether they're registered or not, include the search results in your grants portal profile, but if you uh, would like to take that extra responsibility step, make sure you are able to answer all of the questions on the left-hand side. And so there are some other basic rules of engagement that you all should keep in mind. Um, I'll go through these quickly because this really isn't the uh, focus of this presentation today. Uh, all applicants must maintain contractor oversight. So, you know, you're not gonna hire someone to redo your kitchen and, you know, meet them, say, hey, I want this, 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 and this done. I'll come back in a month to see how you did you know, you're gonna maintain that oversight. You're gonna check in, you know, once a day, twice a day, or every other day, what have you, to make sure that they're performing in line with the project requirements. And that's exactly what you're gonna do for these contracts to be reimbursed by the federal government. Uh, you also need to make sure you are only procuring out of necessity. And it's a little easier to define necessity in disaster situations. You know, you lose one generator, you procure one generator. Uh, in response to COVID-19, it is kind of hard because you don't, you don't know how much you need right now. You don't know the impact on your community right now. Um, so just making, make sure, you know, moving forward, you are being reasonable and responsible uh, with federal funds. 
uh, and you are always able to justify the amount procured. Also, all applicants need, need to have a code of conduct governing the behavior of all employees involved in the procurement process. This needs to be included in your procurement policies and procedures. And then also, you need to have written standards for how you're going to deal with conflicts of interest. And so this also needs to be in your procurement policies and procedures. Number five is very straightforward. Gifts, do not accept them. Um, the federal rules, they don't have a monetary threshold where something suddenly becomes a gift, but many state laws uh, do, and also many local uh, communities have uh, gift restrictions. So this is one where you need to know the state laws as well as your own. You know, I think the state of Virginia has a gift law of $1, meaning applicants can't even accept a cup of coffee from their contractors. So make sure you're doing your due diligence. You're not accepting any gifts. You know, there's no bribery involved. Uh, we did touch on responsible contracting on the last slide, so make sure you're going to SAM.gov. Uh, make sure you're going to SAM.gov to see if that contractor is suspended or debarred. We will touch on the record uh, on the next slide, so I won't dive into it too deeply here. But applicants also need to make sure that they have, you know, a, re a remedies clause. Um, or at, if your work does not hit that threshold, make sure that you have a means for how you're going to settle any sort of disputes uh, between you and the contractor. FEMA is not a party to the contract, and so we aren't going to help you guys settle any sort of disputes. Um, any issues you have with your contractor, you are solely responsible for. We also have three encouraged standards. We do support uh, intergovernmental agreements. By intergovernmental agreements, we're talking joint procurements, cooperative purchasing. Uh, these are, you know, procurement methods that allow the applicant to sometimes get a better price, uh, allow them to uh, respond quickly in emergency situations. And so if these types of procurements, if these services, um, help you all in your response or recovery efforts, we do encourage you to use them. We also encourage the use of federal excess and surplus property, and so by that we mean, uh, you know, we encourage you guys to use GSA, use the list of schedules available to you all, um, because you might be able to find property at a reduced price, and you know, we are always going to support the lowest, most effective cost option, and if that happens to be through GSA, that's wonderful. Uh, make sure that you are checking that site to see if you can get a better price. Uh, we also encourage value engineering clauses. Um, this is going to be your near construction or engineer contracts. Um, and they are clauses that provide for a uh, incentive for these contractors to come below the proposed project cost. Um, and so by being more efficient, um, and reducing the total cost of the project, it means a little bit more money in the contractor's pocket. Um, okay, I'll continue. I mean, I, I feel like I see questions coming in. I'm just not able to see them. So does the Buy American Act apply? Um, And so are you limited to only purchasing within the United States? No, that is not applicable. Uh, you can uh, purchase through contractors or vendors in other, um, in other countries. Uh, just once again, you know, you are subject to responsible, uh, the responsibility determination, reasonable cost, you know, all the same rules and regulations apply. All right. And so now we're going to touch on records. Uh, this is the most important slide in the entire presentation. And so all applicants must maintain records sufficient to detail the entire history of procurement. And so we're looking for records um, 
letting us understand why you chose that method of procurement. You know, uh, why did you choose sealed bidding over competitive proposals? If you're sole sourcing, why did you have to sole source? So make sure you're including that justification. Uh, we want any sort of documentation letting us know why you conducted that specific method of procurement. Uh, we also want to understand why you chose that contract type. Uh, so why does fixed price make sense over unit price? If you're using a time and materials contract, make sure you're providing that justification. We also want to understand your selection of contractor. There are a lot of documents that can go into uh, selection of contractors. So we want to see your evaluation criteria. We want to see your bid tabs. We want to see those bids. We want to see your search at SAM.gov. Uh, we want to see those meeting minutes where you were discussing the various attributes of all those contractors. There are a lot of things that you can provide for selection of contractor so that FEMA has a better understanding of what happened in your procurement process. Uh, and then also we need to uh, adequately understand how you got to your contract price. So we want to see those independent estimates. We want to see that you conducted a cost to price analysis. We want to see those bids. Uh, once again, we want to see that bid tab. Uh, we we want to see what you are offered. Um, and so there, there's a lot of documentation you can provide. I, I don't don't be afraid of over documenting. Like if you think, oh, FEMA doesn't want this, FEMA doesn't want to see this, it's too much. Who cares? It's our job to go through it. You know, protect yourselves. Provide anything and everything you think could even potentially have to do with your projects. Um, and that's because, you know, you can do everything right, but if you are unable to document that you did so, it doesn't matter. All right, so make sure you are documenting. Document, document, document. This is the most important thing that I can say throughout this entire uh, presentation. And so we'll touch quickly on pre-awarded or pre-existing contracts in emergency or exigent circumstances. And so we've gotten a lot of questions, you know, can I use it? I have this contract in place. I didn't follow the federal procurement rules. Can I still use it? And the answer is yes. In emergency and exigent circumstances, you can use your non-compliant pre-awarded contracts. All right. And so if you are planning on doing so, we do recommend that you try to bring that contract into compliance. And so if you can make an amendment and get the required contract provisions in there, you know, we, we definitely recommend that you do so. If you are unable to do so, that's okay, because this is an emergency or exigent circumstance. But you need to make sure that you're justifying. So this is one of those instances where you need to drop that justification using the template on the e and &E fact sheet. Um, just letting us know why you need to use this contract to get the job done. All right, and so last question. Can an entity use a non-compliant pre-existing contract? Answer yes or no, and then Barry can let me know when we are good to continue. And I do have some questions for you that I'll start on after you finish up. Okay. Is there a way I can see the questions? I don't know why I can't see um, them. You should have a, um, down the bottom, a box to open up. Or do you have a box to the right-hand side on your screen? It should say participants, chat, Q&A. Mm, yep. So the one I'm starting at is a 231 after we can, you can go ahead and move on. 231. All right, I might need you to read me That's the fine. questions actually. That's fine. Okay. All right. Well, we're almost done, actually, so I can just take the rest of the questions at the end. I think we only have, you know, two slides, although I know you have um, some final slides. You would like yeah, to mine are real quick. I'll just finish up with the fiscal first aid stuff. Okay. 
Uh, so just a quick recap for state entities. So everything we went over today was applicable to non-state entities, unless I specifically stated uh, applicable to state entities. And so a quick recap for state entities in E and E circumstances. Once again, make sure you're following your own policies and procedures. So whatever your emergency procurement policies and procedures are, uh, whatever is outlined in your procurement manual, that needs to be what you are following. Uh, additionally, make sure you are still complying with the use of recovered materials and all of your contracts include the required contract provision. So remember, for state entities, you still just have to follow the same three uh, regulations. And so also, while the rules don't prohibit state entities from using time and materials or cost plus percentage of cost contracts, we do discourage states from doing so because it does increase the likelihood of unreasonable costs. And so I'm gonna to quickly touch on some of the resources. Let me close the window here. It's just sort of raining, it might be a little loud. Okay, and so just a few tools available to you all. If you wanna take a look at the rules that we went over today, you can go to ecfr.gov and search for 2 CFR sections 200.317 through 200.326. Um, you can also go to the PDAT website. I brought it up a couple times today, uh, but we have a ton of helpful resources. We have the contract provisions template I directed you all to, that E&E &E fact sheet. Uh, we do have COVID-19 specific <laughs> guidance. We will have this video available on the website in the upcoming week as well. Um, and just a ton of other fact sheets and checklists and things that you all can use throughout your uh, procurements as well. And also make sure that you are utilizing SAM.gov. It's gonna help you in your responsibility determination. There are two other uh, resources left off of this slide here. Um, so also make sure you're utilizing your state emergency management representative or your FEMA regional point of contact if you have any questions specific to eligibility, uh, the reimbursement process, any questions about FEMA, they are definitely there to guide you throughout this process. If you have any procurement related questions, once you are, uh, you know, going, uh, moving along in the uh, FEMA reimbursement process, you can direct them to your PDMG and they will get uh, moved up to us, PDAT, and we can answer any of your questions as well. And then the documents for download, I provided Barry with the emergency and exigency fact sheet, so make sure you are using that. I also provided him with the contract provisions template, so feel free to download that as well. And then I also included PUG presentation replays. Uh, these replays go include everything we've discussed today and more. And so it's just a document that goes over briefly all of the federal procurement regulations. Uh, it's a quick reference um, little document. I'm not sure, I don't remember how many pages it is, but it just condenses and simplifies a lot of the rules for you all. Uh, so make sure you are using that if you have any questions after this presentation. Uh, yep. All right, and that is it for me. I will pass it back to Barry, and he can take over from here. Okay. Um, and yeah, if you can just see the, the um, GFOA website for fiscal first aid, you will have um, access to the slides and um, a replay of today's, of all of our fiscal first aid webinars. Um, any other, and he just mentioned some of the supplementary, supplementary materials that have been provided. Um, you know, we, we are continuously updating the site, so there will be more documentation as time goes on. Um, and there are just a wealth of other materials at that site, so feel free to access that at any time. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to go over a couple questions here with Eve. Um, first one being, Eve, how will your, our own definition of emergency be interpreted by FEMA? Um, statement is that it seems risky and very open to challenge. So that is a very good question, but the program area does make that determination. Um, it is every applicant's responsibility to adequately define and document their emergency circumstance. Uh, the 
template uh, does kind of guide you through a series of questions that your responses and your documentation should be answering. Uh, is what FEMA, what public assistance will consider when reviewing your procurement uh, documentation. And so, you know, I can't speak to emergency and exigent circumstances beyond what they are legally. The program area will have to fill in the blanks, but I will say, you know, as long as it's adequately documented, adequately justified, there has been very little pushback from the program area. And even with OIG, you know, the people who do the audits of all of the FEMA grants, they very rarely question costs. Uh, procured through emergency or exigent circumstances. So uh, just make sure you're doing your part to ad adequately uh, define and document. And the next one is, uh, so is January 27th the official start date for COVID? Does this apply to potential payroll reimbursements for work related specifically to COVID that might be reimbursable? So you would need to reach out to the program area to discuss any sort of eligible work or eligible cost. Uh, and when they are, you know, uh, uh, when that emergency time period uh, began, what type of work covered, I will say you can probably find your answer on the FEMA um, COVID-19 response webpage, there's a ton of information. And if you just Google FEMA COVID-19, it's going to pop up. And it has a lot of the eligibility requirements uh, for work, uh, the time frame, um, what constitutes an emergency protective measure. Um, so I, I'll, I, I'll direct you there, and if you have any further questions, you would need to reach out to your FEMA regional point of contact. Thank you. Do we as a city have to get city council to declare the official emergency dates in justifying our own period? Uh, no, you don't have to declare anything. Um, just make sure you are documenting to FEMA your emergency circumstance, your emergency time period, and justifying that time period. And so if you say that your emergency is a year, then you need to be able to clearly outline why you will not be able to conduct a competitive method of procurement in an entire year. Um, and so that is you know, generally where you can see pushback from the program area. Uh, some people who have extremely long emergency periods, people who continuously renew or extend their emergency periods, you know, it's a three-month contract which becomes a six-month and a nine-month and then a year. And that's when the program area is going to look at it and say, okay, all right, guys, you know, this is getting, getting a little out of hand. Um, you have not adequately justified why in this time frame you were unable to conduct a competitive procurement. Um, so no, you don't have to declare anything. Just make sure you are letting FEMA know what your emergency time period is and you are justifying it. Uh, I think you've answered this a number of times. Where is the list of suggested elements for providing documentation for sole source? Uh, I believe that's in your packet that we've uploaded and you have sites already identified in the presentation, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, is reimbursement only available when hiring contractors, or would current employees performing the work rather than furloughing employees be reimbursable? We talked about so, that a little bit. Yeah, so you're, that's a question about uh, forced account labor. And so, you know, forced account labor is, is um, of course, eligible through the public assistance program. If you have any questions on force account labor, you would need to talk to someone about from public assistance, um, contact your FEMA regional point of contact, and they can give you any sort of information on uh, eligibility criteria there. Thank you. One purchase agreement with a vendor is considered one procurement, correct? want to say yes, but because I feel like that, that might be confusing. So you can have 
a contract and issue purchase orders off of that contract. And you can issue multiple purchase orders off of that contract. Um, but the overarching agreement is the contract. That is the master contract. And so all of those separate purchase orders, although yes, they, they are, it's kind of the call to arms as in, okay, it's time for us to work now, but the rules applicable to those purchase orders were outlined in, and are outlined in the master contract and in the original solicitation for that work. Okay. Um, do material purchases require the same uh, contract provisions? For example, does a purchase for supplies require the same as a purchase for services? Yes. And so we get this question a lot, um, especially for purchases through the use of um, P cards. Um, so yeah, the contract provisions are applicable for goods and services. I will say though, do, not all of them apply all the time. And so you should use the contract provisions template because there are gonna be cases where none of them are required. Um, but there might be cases where one or all. And so you need to be using the contract provisions template to help you determine when these uh, provisions need to be included. Okay. Um, who is the recipient in the attached FEMA contract clause? Who is the recipient in the... In the attached FEMA con? I'm not sure what that exactly means. Um, let's I'm go on. Sure. For the cost, cost or price analysis and bonding requirements, Non-state entities follow the most restrictive simplified acquisition threshold, which is maybe and generally is less than 250,000, correct? So a cost of price analysis, the way it's written is for procurements over $250,000. Um, so even if their own simplified acquisition threshold is lower than that, um, well, if it's required by their own rules and regulations, then yes, they need to do so. Uh, but it's required for purchases over $250,000 by the federal regulations. And so it, it depends on what your rule says. We okay. don't require it. All right, we have a couple short people. ones. I, I think these are yes or no answers. When we closed City Hall, did expenses related to assisting employees to work from home become eligible for reimbursement? For example, laptops, monitors. Yeah, you would need to, I mean, definitely go to the uh, FEMA COVID-19 Emergency Protective Measures website. Just Google FEMA EPM. Um, and it will give you a whole list of, you know, eligible work or services as a result of COVID-19. Or you can also reach out to your FEMA regional point of contact and they can answer any eligibility questions. Okay, a couple quick more one, a couple more quick ones here before we close off. Um, how long should records relating to the emergency be kept by the municipality? So uh, all records should be maintained for three years after the close of your project. And so after submitting the final expenditure for your project. Uh, so it's different for everyone and it has to do with, you know, how your projects are being processed, but for a minimum of three years after your final expenditure is sub submitted. Okay, um, for basis for contract price with an estimate from uh, entities engineering department be sufficient enough for establishing that said basis? So for your independent estimate, so you're using your own engineer to help build your uh, scope of work, yes, that's fine. Okay. Um, if we purchase a refrigerated trailer, we anticipate might be needed to use for storage of bodies based upon current modeling. However, the models change and it doesn't end up being utilized to store bodies, would it still be eligible for FEMA reimbursement? So you would need, that's an eligibility question. You would need to reach out to a public assistance representative to help you there. Um, reach out to your FEMA regional contact and they can help you. 
Um, is cooperative purchasing permitted? I believe you answered that. Yes, it is permitted. It is allowed. Make sure you are still following all of the federal procurement rules and regulations if you are going to utilize cooperative purchasing. Okay. Um, can a state, non-state agency submit its own labor costs for reimbursement? I think you answered that one already. Um, yep. And let's see, can laptops be eligible? We, we answered that one. Um, I think it's, uh, well, we have one more here. How does the FEMA reimbursement and the CARES Act differ as far as eligible costs associated with COVID-19? So I won't be speaking about eligibility. If you have any questions about, I guess, the conflicts or potential issues between the CARES Act and eligible costs through uh, FEMA's public assistance program, you would have to reach out to your FEMA regional point of contact. Okay. Thank you, Eve. We appreciate your time. Um, once again, if you need the access to any of the information that's been presented, um, it's in the presentation. It's also at www.gfoa.org slash FFA. Um, and that concludes today's uh, presentation. Thank you, Eve, very much. All right. Thank you, guys.